the Magic Mike Show, where you hear the experts speak. The Magic Mike Show. Tune into the show every week. The Magic Mike Show. You can trust the show is the bomb because it's being brought to you by RacingDudes.com. What's up, everybody? I'm Magic. And I'm Mike. And this is the Magic Mike Show, episode 540. Mr. Summich. Hey, 540. Nice round run number. Huzzah! <laughs> I like that. Boy, what a weekend. If you were playing the Racing Dudes picks, and that means if you're playing the Bible, Ooh. the premium picks, the Samo bombs, you are rolling in dough. You're Scrooge McDucking it this morning. So happy to have you all joining Mike and I to talk about the last weekend. And the last weekend of Kentucky Derby major prep races, we still have the Lexington this weekend, but the only horse, if he wins, that can make the Derby out of that without a bunch of defections is Hades. And with, yeah, we're not going to talk about that. However, we will focus on the three big preps, the Bluegrass Stakes at Keeneland, the Wood Memorial at Aqueduct, and then, of course, the Santa Anita Derby. But, Mike, what a, what a weekend, man. This was just so fun for horse racing fans. Uh, it was phenomenal. I like we had. I, I thought the Bluegrass was really entertaining. We'll talk about it quite a bit in depth of our, our kind of thoughts coming out of it. The Santa Anita Derby at least provided a good horse race out of it. Uh, the Wood, we had an incident. Fortunately, it wasn't a serious one from what uh, what I've heard from the jockey perspective. And so that's that's a positive. I thought uh, the winner was nice. So we'll have to talk about him as well. We've got some odds markets that we have up over at Circa that we're going to share at some point during the show too to talk a little about what those future prices look on some of these horses as well. Uh, and it's not just like it's nice to have Keeneland back. I, I, you forget about the buzz around Keeneland and just being able to handicap it and then watch the races there. And these boutique meets are really what drives the sport right now, at least from, from my perspective. And that's Saratoga, that's Del Mar, that's Keeneland. I, I'm not a big Oakland fan, but I know people love Oakland as well. And the vibe around that track is very good. So it's great to see some of these. these, these it's great to see one of these tracks back and be able to play them. And then you know, we got it right out of the gate. I don't have a hat on. You do. A hat tip to Magic as well. Hitting the pick five there, the late pick five, the nice little single at the end uh, with Sierra Leone. Paid about 1600 bucks. so congratulations on that, Magic. Well done. Uh, I'm, I'm pissed. I did not have it with you. Alva Star got me, and that was uh, that was one of those where it's like, well, that would have been the next one, but unfortunately, we didn't get there. But uh, Santa Anita provided uh, all the entertainment we needed on Saturday, cashing close to 8700 bucks there for the bomb. So that was phenomenal. And then the guide, like you said, the guide crushed it as well so great weekend over there for the picks excited to have bombs out for wednesday i've already capped the wednesday keeneland card like i'm pumped about having keeneland back it's just nice to have it uh i can hear it in your voice too and uh we're not going to cover the shaker town stakes but hat tip to you and thank you for the compliment i uh, have tip to you i said that those five and a half furlong turf sprints at keeneland are your bread and butter our Zach, man, he, he completes the Woodford Shaker Town double. He looked incredible. Um, so make sure you check out some of the bombs and the premium picks over on the site because things are going well. I do want to put a slight caveat on it. The ticket I gave out on the Magic Mike show did not cash because I didn't use. Um, oh, shoot. I just forgot his name. The horse that won the Commonwealth. Uh, uh, no, no, oh, man. Al Bo Stahl's Cruz. horse. The gray Bo horse. Cruz. Bo Cruz. Bo Cruz. Thank you. I kept wanting to say Bezos. I knew that was wrong for several reasons. Bo Cruz. However, um, unfortunate situation that hear my song scratched right at the gate and kind of reared up and hit his head but they scratched him the 30 seconds while that was happening I, as soon as i saw the jockey get off and start to work on the saddle i was like cancel the pick five throw in a new pick five throwing boat cruise on because i thought about using him before and then when we did the show i was like Shit. And, and then you saw how speed handled at keeneland and i was like i can't i gotta have boat cruise on here and he goes gate to wire so thanks to you for for leaving that one i do want to shout out a uh, good friend shoddy because she was there at keeneland and she plays all the racing dudes picks she plays the bible picks she played the frankenstein ticket for magic mike show biggest score of her life in, in, by far and uh from what i've heard from people in lexington like the police are looking for because she's still out there celebrating casamigos fueled one hell of a weekend for shoddy as well i i love that it was exciting to see shoddy post up that ticket say it was the biggest score of her life 1600 bucks for i think it was like a 72 dollar ticket so absolutely phenomenal there as well and like one more thing i love about keeneland Buchu went off at six to one what the like, what is going on here? And, like, you look at the doubles. It was the second choice, third choice in the doubles. Uh, you saw a bunch of money laid on poolside for Slim. Goes down from 9-1 to one to 5-1. to one. And, and Bushu is the one that floats up up to 6-1. to one. I was, like, I was in shock when I saw I was, like, I didn't have a win bet on it because I didn't think we were getting 6-1. to one. And then I see 6-1. to one. I'm, like, oh, man, that was a missed opportunity because that was a heck of a price after we saw that money come in on Bushu. Or come in on, yeah, on poolside with Slim. 
top top pick for both of us in that race was Buku, and I think we both had Arzak on top in the turf sprint, and it's like those two horses both paid very well. I actually I think it was the Wood Memorial was going on right uh, as they were breaking for the Appalachian, so I was finishing up my coverage on that, and I clicked back over and I saw that I'd won a lot of money just having a win bet on Buku, and I thought where like I Where'd saw this come from balance changed, and I was like, what? That's not what it was when I looked 10 minutes ago. And then I was like, clicked on the Appalachian and I just, I texted Aaron in all caps. I was like, Buku was six to one. I could not believe it. But listen, sometimes the horse racing gods give it and other times they take it away. They definitely gave it to us this past weekend. They did. And Doc mentioned it here. The pick six paid $36,000. And Bo Cruz, we like, I, I was too deep there. That was one horse I love. Buju pays it's six to one. They have a single at the end with Sierra Leone as well. Still got 36,000 out of that thing. There wasn't anybody that was that difficult, but the fact that it's a dollar denomination, there was a carryover heading into the day. And you had, you know, I, I mean, I don't think Bo Cruz was 12 to one in the morning line. I don't think anyone thought that was going to be a 12 to one horse, but you'd, it, you'd had to have those middling prices, but it's the big fields. And that's one of the things I love about Keelan's. You get these big fields. You don't have to come in with bombs. You don't need a 30 to one to juice up the payouts in this stuff because there, you, when you got 12 horses in the Appalachian, you get nine to one on, or six to one on Bushu. That's a huge part of it. Like that, that yep. horse is a separator in there because for some reason dead on the board, it was just, just shocking. Uh, we said it uh, at the start of the Magic Mike show last week. All you need, and I think you said it actually specifically, you just need to be right once or twice all weekend long at Keeneland, and it's going to pay very well. So uh, thanks to everybody that helped us get those six to one price on Buku and, and for the those pick five scores. I, Shadi also got to experience what it's like to have a single at the end of a late pick, five, <laughs> the end of a pick five sequence and have to. And not only that, you have a closer. We'll talk about this race first in a second. You have a closer on a speed favoring track that you know is going to tap a tricet and go to the back and make one big ass run. And it's like, I, uh, she didn't hedge. She even hit the try in that race, too. She just kind of doubled down with the trifecta and, and was able to nail that. So, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. Before, um, we jump, but, yeah. I say, before we jump into it, Alex just brought up the morning line discussion. There was a lot of talk yesterday specifically. I think there was back to back races. Horses went off at 30 to, or morning lines were 30 to 1 and 15 to 1, went off significantly shorter. Both of them won. I think 15 to 1 won at 8 to 5. There were some scratches. Uh, that's definitely part of it. I also think it's very difficult to make uh, lines at Keeneland in some of these races. So I yeah. like. I, I think it's the important thing about morning lines is they are guidance from a single person on what they believe fair odds will be when the gate breaks. That's pretty much it. It's not even the person's opinion on who will win the race or anything like that. They're just trying to handicap what the public is going to do. And with the boutique meets, with Saratoga, with Delmar, with Keeneland, there's information that gets out on some of these and it may not get to the morning line person by the time that they have to actually submit those morning lines. Uh, and that can, you can see drastic adjustments because of that. Excuse me. I believe it is uh, not trying to, to throw them out there for any reason. But I fully agree with everything you said. And also I've never tried making a morning line. I know from talking to John white, how difficult and, and how, uh, intensive that can be. Uh, I believe Nick Tamro still does it. He was yeah. just named to, to replace, um, Mike Battaglia a couple of years ago, and I think he still does Keeneland odds make. He also does uh, Sam Houston, which if we ever get to bet Sam Houston again, we'll be covering it here on the show. I don't know if we ever will, but that's who does it. <laughs> I, I like, by the way, morning line odds maker, never a job I want. Like there's absolutely no. a, a thankless job. If you nail yes. it, no one's like, wow, this person did a great job. No, it's only when you have these situations that you ever hear about the morning line and the odds races. Um, and Sam Houston, I, I legit miss Sam Houston. I tweeted like I miss betting on SHRP over the weekend. Like a Friday night, man, those were such great cards to be able to play thoroughbred racing. And it was competitive races. You had the pools that were perfect and you were able to be uh, be able to get big payouts if you're able to beat one or two favorites. And it was just it was so much fun playing that. Hopefully we get uh, Texas Racing back at some point, get to bet Lone Star and Sam Houston when you're not actually at those two tracks. Yeah, it's uh we miss it. My phone battery doesn't miss it, but but we do miss it in general, the, the Sam Houston play. All right, we've got three Kentucky Derby prep races to talk about in depth. And then at the end of those three races, we're going to talk about the current odds to win over at Circa right now, which is going to give us a very good clue as to what the betting public might do for the Kentucky Derby. Let's get into it, buddy. Right is up.
All right, Mike, here on the screen, the first race we'll talk about is the grade one Toyota Bluegrass Stakes Race 10. All three prep races, by the way, Race 10. <laughs> That's kind of a funny thing. They didn't try to make them all fit together from a TV perspective, but hey, here we are. You see Sierra Leone, the 10 horse, goes off as the 8-5 to five favorite, drops right back along with Mugatu, and uh, you knew this was going to happen. He's going to go back, make his one big run. What did you think about his effort here and the race overall? I thought it was a very good effort from Sierra Leone. Uh, the the you, it's exactly what you expected, I guess, is what you should say. Like when you have a horse that's eight to five in this type of field, you know they're going to close. We've seen him do it. We saw him do it down at fairgrounds as well. I, I was, I, um, I, it's hard. Like I don't want to bash this horse, and that's one of the big things. I, this was a really good race from a very good race horse. That's pretty much my takeaway, though. It's like, I, I'm not sure how much I want to extrapolate this out. The pace was honest in front of him. I thought that obviously benefited him. When he got his stride going, he looked like an absolute freight train closing. So you got to give him credit for that. In the stretch, you saw a turn of foot there. I thought it was really impressive with, with how he ran in this race. I'm not sure this is a horse I'm all that interested in the first Saturday of May. We'll get into that a little bit further as well. I'm also, like, you can only be what's in front of you. What do we think was really in front of him here? Like, I, I knew going into this race, the fact that I was picking Encino and BU as my top two horses, that I was not going to like the winner of this race much because that, that kind of tells you what I thought of the field, um, especially BU part of it. But like right here, when he starts rolling, like he was just a freight train coming down the stretch. You knew he was going to be able to get the job done. I, I am interested to see how people handle this horse because there's a there's a lot of tapetrice in inside Sierra, Le Sierra Leone. That to me is the, the the best comp you can make of any Derby horse in the, the near future. He is a he is a much more talented version of tapetrice, but very similar. And like you saw in this stretch, like he got rolling and, and like you said, a freight train aptly described. But he's going to need literally twice as many horses in front of him in his next race to, to get around and to get past. And there's so many of those horses we know are going to be cheap speed and stumble bunnies that aren't going to want the distance. And he's going to have to navigate around all of those. He's going to have to be super wide. He and Forever Young both. But Forever Young, we assume, is going to be much more forwardly placed than Sierra Leone. Let's talk about the four door knock. He goes off as the 5-2 to two favorite. We both were against him here. A lot of people on the show was uh, we're against them to see Doc Green's. Yeah, we all seem to be uh, almost universally against from the Magic Mike Army against Doorknock here. And I understand trainer Danny Gargan saying we, we want to try seeing if he'll rate because, uh, you know, it's going to be hard to beat fierceness on the front end in the Kentucky Derby. But clearly that that experiment didn't work here. Do you think that this horse can rebound and just you now, you know, you've got to send him. Can he rebound in the Kentucky Derby? No, no, he can't. Like I, I was down on door knock after <clears throat> I believe it was the fountain of youth. And like, I did, yeah. I have no interest in getting back in on door knock. I, this is, it's a horse that just is a cup below the top tier here. And, and I thought it was interesting. You know, obviously Chad Brown has Sierra Leone. You had a couple horses in here from Chad Brown. You were expecting to see speed from and, and top Connor and good money. And top Connor took it to Sierra Leone right from the jump. And that was a big difference here. And, and or I'm sorry, took it to door knock right from the jump. And that was a big yeah. difference. I just don't see Doorknock being able to really improve off a stalking trip. And they they went decently fast here. I mean, we're talking 110 for six furlongs. That's pretty good. 46 for a half. And you can see in the stretch, everyone's just going up and down. I mean, no one else is really moving forward outside of Sierra Leone in this race. And, and to me, that's a, a big part of it. Now, Just a Touch obviously runs a pretty good second there. I thought that was a, a decently impressive race considering where Just a Touch was compared to where Sierra Leone was. Um, but door knock for me is it's just a hard <laughs> pass. And, and we'll get to the odds in a second here. I was surprised to see it. But one more thing before everyone says, you know, like they, they're all over the Tapatrice thing. You know, he's way better than Tapatrice. So like you're smoking, homie. Let's not forget Tapatrice was the favorite in the Derby last year. Like going into the Derby, there was a lot of Tapatrice love out there. I would say one in every five people I ran into were picking Tapatrice. Like they, they, it, you can't take a look at I'm comparing him to Tapatrice heading into the Derby. Not the overall three-year-old season from Tappet Trice, which is very different <laughs> than what we saw. But heading into the Derby, you can't tell me that, that there's not comparisons between Tappet Trice and Doorknock here. I made the argument that Tappet Trice was the most likely horse to be last at the finish line. Guess what? Sierra Leone right up there for the most likely horse to be last the first, first time under the finish line uh, for Saturday in May as well. 
I think if you would uh, touch on Dornock one more time, same exact silks uh, and trained by Danny Gargan. A horse was second in the Wood Memorial. So if the, he had two horses in different prep races, Danny Gargan did with same ownership. And one was going to hit the board and one was going to be, I thought he finished like sixth or seventh Dornock did. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. He got fourth. Okay. That's how bad I thought he did in this race. Um, it was the horse that went off at 100 plus 107 to one. <laughs> like, not. Not doorknock. We'll get to that race in a second here. Um, uh, listen, I think Top Connor did exactly what we thought he was going to do. Jose Ortiz, I thought, rode him exactly the way he should have. Broke from the rail. He's got the speed. This was his second career start. Watch out for this horse in the future. The, he's not going to be a derby horse. I don't know if he's even a, a Belmont horse, but watch out for Top Connor. That horse was pretty good. Uh, but as far as the rest of the field goes, you talked about it, Mike. Um, just a touch finished his second. He was second almost the entire race right here. He got past top Connor and for a second flow thought he was going to win the race. He forgot that there was a freight train also entered in the field. Um, Epic ride was third throughout door knock fourth throughout finishes fourth. Mugatu kind of rallied late to get up for fifth, which I thought was fun. A horse went off at 181 to one. So, uh, those three people that had that ticket, probably very excited by Mugatu coming from the back with Sierra Leone, but Nobody really advanced. Uh, they just kind of ran in place there. Just to touch has got upside. Third career start. Back-to-back -back second place finishes. Continues stretching out in distance. Do you have any interest in him to hit the board in the Kentucky Derby, possibly? Uh, possibly. Uh, just to touch is one I'm going to want to look at a little bit more. Um, I'm going to go back and watch the races as well and just see if there there is an angle there. I mean, obviously, the, the barn is very good. We've seen Cox be able to do well with these type of horses come derby time. So I think you have to at least respect just a touch. And like you said, very lightly raced. So the, you can expect improvement or you could project improvement. Um, I don't know if you expect it, but you can project it if you want yeah. to. To try and be able to say, okay, we can take a step forward here. And I, I like out of everybody else in this race, the only one I would have any interest in would be just a toss. I, I agree with you. I think Top Connor uh, has a shot to make some noise. We'll see what happens. I wouldn't be shocked if we see him in some of the one mile races and the undercards of the uh, the triple crown races versus being in the major triple crown races. But uh, I, I think that just a touch has a chance to take a step forward. It's going to be price dependent for me, though. It's all about what the price is. I do like the running style from just a touch more than I like Sierra Leone. So I think that's a positive. If you are looking mm -hmm. to round out your super, round out your try. Yeah, the very interesting horse. And with the one win, I think that you will see people uh, uh, definitely thinking he's leaving him off of their tickets at least to win. So should get a decent price on him. Um, I think he could handle, you know, running far. He showed that he could stalk. He sat behind Top Connor by a length throughout. So it advanced when asked and maybe just, you know, he gets a little leg weary. Someone catches him. But again, like you said, Mike. Uh, hits the superfecta there. Um, and Rodney says he likes Epic Ride for the Pat Day Mile. It was nice to see the Turfway horse. We talked about on the show, Turfway Park horses going to Keeneland. It's, it's yeah. good. It's a good angle. Epic yeah. Ride, usually one that needs to be on the front end. So it was nice to see that he could sit off. He, he was beating, you know, five and some links here, but a good effort from him. Uh, let's see. Did I saw somebody bring it up. Somebody asked if he got cut off. Oh, Gary. Yeah. Um, I went back and watched Gary. And by the way, hi, Gary. Good to see you. Um, he didn't cut him off as, as Sierra Leone was passing him. Epic ride just cut inside. He yeah. came in there, but um, he didn't, didn't affect him. He definitely came over yes. on him, but he didn't affect him because of how he was moving. Where do you think Encino would have finished? Oh, geez. Uh, I think he would have been in a photo with just a touch for a second. I think it would have been, or may, maybe not, not that close, but I think he would have uh, been coming because he's a horse that likes to pass horses. He's, he, you know, he probably would have been stuck a little wide earlier, but that's my hope for him. I don't know. What do you think? I think he would have been in the exacta. I'm not sure which spot it would have been, but I think he would have been in the exacta. I, I wish he had stayed in the race. I realized the post wasn't great and that the connections decided not to, but I, I think he would have ended up first or second. Pedlo says, hi, Gary Medic. So neighborly. He's literally my neighbor. That's what neighbor <laughs> it's, you know, he, we're in the same little town in LA. That's why I said hi to him. So just uh, doing that. One. All right. Let's talk about the Wood Memorial Stakes next uh resilience gets the win boy another horse out of the risen star wins a big prep race mike he breaks sharply from the rail uh by the way if you're watching this this is the edited version from naira's feed so the accident with the number 12 even though he is thank god okay uh we're not gonna see that on screen so don't worry if you, if you don't want to see that here but um resilience broke sharp i like that he kind of took back a little bit here let the six uh, evening news go out to the front and then just when it was asked he, he took off and a very clear winner here 
But it's the Wood Memorial. Who the hell did he beat, Mike? Yeah, I mean, it's the same question, right? It's it's especially considering that Deterministic doesn't run a very good race. Um, and so you're kind of wondering, okay, what, what do we expect? I will say this, though. Like, visually, this was a really impressive effort. I mean, because he, he was right on these fractions, which were a little quick again in this race. And you see him just kind of move up three wide without ever being asked and just clearly is the winner of this race from the, what, half mile pull in like no one else was winning this race from that point on and i thought it was really professional to be able to kind of break it looked like he almost wanted the lead he gets caught off a little bit in the first turn has to check back then swings wide here and right here when you start to see like we're not asking at all and we just start mm -hmm. to creep up and as soon as you see a little pressure from the horses behind he's just completely in hand three wide here and just kind of propels himself to the lead without really being asked very much. And, and you see some of the jockeys already moving here. Nothing on the one. Like, this is still a hand ride. And clearly, this horse is winning this race at this point. Uh, so I thought this was visually a very impressive race. Not sure what you beat, but you really you, you beat them very clearly and easily. So uh, to me, it was one of those spots where, like, yeah, I'm a little interested because we went quick and they got the trip. Now, get a little leg weary here. You can see it with the little in and out. But... Mm -hmm. I, I do think this was a really impressive performance and a horse that I, I'm at least interested in looking at, depending on where we draw in the Derby and what the price is going to be. Uh, yeah, I agree. Another one that can probably hit the board. Uh, breeding wise, he's biting to mischief out of the smart strike mare. Doesn't scream that he's going to love going a mile and a quarter, but uh, with the right trip, um, you know, it's Bill Mott, you know, they'll have him ready for it. I'm curious who ends up riding him. And this is something we'll discuss uh, until there's a, a rider announced. John Velasquez rode him here. I thought it was noteworthy, by the way, that John Velasquez skipped going to Keeneland to ride this horse at Aqueduct. Um, so I understand that one. Yeah, there you go. Chris Maiello, completely agree. Uh, yeah. should have, should have seen that. I was all over the nine Tuscan sky and, and he never did better than what he's doing right there. The nine horse, the gray. He's a good, he, he looks nice, but that he did not run well here. But um, yeah, with, I think Jose Ortiz could get the mount on this horse. Uh, Junior Alvarado might. I know that's Bill Mott's usually his go-to guy uh, for riding big races. So um, should have a good jockey aboard him here. It's, he's got a bright future. It's just a question of is, is the derby where he goes? And if he doesn't win the derby or do very well there, you could see him shut down and then not wait until he's a four-year-old to come back. That's kind of the Bill Mott style. I wouldn't be shocked if this is like a Jim Dandy type horse if we don't run. If, I, I would be surprised if we're not in the Derby. I think he'll run in the Derby. Yeah. And then the question is, if he doesn't do well, when do we see him next? And I wouldn't be shocked if it's it's Saratoga. It's like Jim Dandy style to try and go to the Travers, that type of thing. Um, I, look, th th this was impressive. And and people like the fact that that. Again, Johnny V didn't have to ask him very much. And you mentioned this is a mod horse who was was kind of propelled up into the stakes company quickly and into his career. And then this is the second time we saw him in stakes company. I thought it was a really good effort. I also thought it was very telling the horse got bet. So six to one on the morning line, deterministic gets absolutely hammered in this race. And yet mm -hmm. we go off at nine to two. It's the one horse that that took money into the teeth of deterministic as well. So I thought that was a one of those another hat tip there. So we'll see what's 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 uh, what the future is going to look like here. But again, this is a horse that much like uh, much like just a touch has the right style to be able to blow up the superfecta and, and make some noise in the derby because you, you're going to have less of trip trouble depending on where you draw obviously but less of a trip trouble uh, than you are if you're a uh, Sierra Leone if you're uh, catching freedom if you're uh, Anna Marie right where horses that are coming from way back of the pack the eight horse Elysian Meadows right there you, you see him drop back suddenly there's a photo that uh, our photographer Eclipse Sportswire posted where you just see like that horse is getting sandwiched so bad. Um, so I'm willing to get, I don't think he's a derby quality horse, but I'm willing to give him a pass. Uh, the five protective is also right there at the tail end. And he uh, got taken up early after the break and then came running. I think he's an interesting one moving forward, but it's hard for me to get super excited about any of these, Mike, because the second place horse and you know, that I see that, that Rodney says that they were high on this horse, just like they were doorknock. Society Man was 107 to 1, and he yep. got up for a second. Now, congratulations to Jackie Luis Rivera Jr. I hope he keeps the mount because he rode this horse to get second. Like, he was on the horse to get him into the Derby. It'd be cool if that kid got to go ride in the Kentucky Derby. But that's another reason why I'm like, eh, part of me likes resilience. Part of me is like, ah, don't do it. Don't do it because of that. Yeah, I, I, the one thing I would say about this race is the odds are kind of funky, right? I, I mean, we saw the, a deterministic get bet down to 90 cents on the dollar. You saw Tuscan Sky take a money down to 295. I, I mean, you have 
Resilience was four and a half to one. And Yabunkle Heavy, who I thought actually ran a pretty good race after an absolutely atrocious start and a terrible post, uh, yes. 10 to one. And after that, the next lowest was 30 to one. So we skipped all the tens, all the twenties, everything and just ballooned right up to 30. So like if deterministic ran this race and Tuscan Sky doesn't run well, you're going to guarantee yourself you're getting bombs that are 30 plus to one that are going to be in the super. And so the fact that it was the 11 instead of the five or something to me, that's not, not as big of an issue from an odds perspective, just because this was a really funky odds race. Uh, great stat here from Rodney. Todd Pletcher is now one for 36 in the last few years, going from allowance race with Lasix to stakes races with no Lasix. Once again, the Lasix rule is stupid. That's not the problem in horse racing. It stops growing with that. Ugh, hate that. Um, Let's see. Uh, I was going to go to someone. Uh, Lou thinks that the Derby winner is either going to be Sierra Leone, Honor Marie, or Forever Young. So Lou's thinking there's going to be a, a, a pace meltdown here because all three of those horses like to come from off the pace, and two of them like to run very wide. But I do, I do love the Honor Marie love. So we, we appreciate that. On that's always going to get you a, a post up here on the show if you praise Honor Marie. We're going to love that for you. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like uh, I like this too. Like people are talking about it. Like Roddy's mentioned it. The, the winner here. Um, Yep. It was has only run twice, never longer than a mile. Your second choice has only beaten six horses, uh, in seven beat horses. Nash in and Nash is terrible, <laughs> right? But that was a three horse race. Like that was yes, the thing. Is that. That a lot of it was the buzz around around Tuscan Sky was coming out of a three horse race where they beat the third horse by like twenty eight lengths or something crazy. It's like that's not really a horse race. Like that's kind of just a, a glorified workout in a lot of ways. So uh, because of the two favorites, you're going to get some funky stuff here, and then you got to kind of sift through it and decide how you feel about the race after the fact. Also, one last note on the odds there: El Grande O scratching late. That yeah, was that a, a th that too. took a that really screwed up the odds as well because and a I lot of that money. El Grande O was like twelve to one, so that was your middling horse in that that mm -hmm. range that that got taken out of the pool as well. Yeah, um, here we go. Yeah, John G. How many Derby runners did Sierra Leone beat in the Risen Star? Uh, there are so last year's Risen Star, the top three horses went to the Kentucky Derby. Two of them hit the trifecta. Neither of them won, but two of them hit the trifecta. This year, the Risen Star winner, Sierra Leone, he's in. Track Phantom, I don't have any reason to believe that they won't send Track Phantom if we don't like him for it. Yep. Catching Freedom wins the Louisiana Derby. Yep. Resilience wins the Wood. Honor Marie is right there behind Catching Freedom in Louisiana. Five, The top five from the Risen Star are, go, are in the Kentucky Derby right now. That's just... <laughs> <laughs> pretty impressive i mean it's it's clearly the key race and sierra leone won it so you gotta you gotta give sierra leone credit for that um i don't think we saw the best version of catching freedom around marie <laughs> in the risen star we talked about that heading into the louisiana derby so I, I do think that there is room for both of them to improve now obviously sierra leone could take a step forward again as well um and like the price delta is also what you have to talk about with all those horses because we're going to get to those odds at the end, and that to me is a big part of uh, of what it, it came from. And I know this is another point by John that I love. When was the last time the Breeders' Cup Juvenile was a key race? Like it, because right now that's looking like a pretty important race when you think about it and who you have coming out of that race and how well they've done through this uh, Triple Crown season. I want to just off of a guess. I want to say it was the 2017 edition, so six years ago. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, 2017 when Good Magic did it. Um, there were some good horses in there, but yeah, no, that's a great point. That's a really great point, John. Uh, all right. The last race we're going to talk about the third prep over here in our neck of the woods, the grade one Santa Anita Derby. And like Aaron said in the Kentucky Derby update video, which was posted earlier today, if you haven't yet, go check that out. If you're watching live, wait till we're done and then go check it out. Uh, it's nice that we finally have a Santa Anita Derby winner. That's going to be in the Kentucky Derby because it was not a Bob Baffert trainee. It was my boy stronghold got the job done. Um, speed figures aside, super exciting race. I loved seeing this horse battle with imagination. What did you think about it? Uh, I thought it was a great horse race. That's yes. my positive <laughs> takes on this race. Like imagination took a pretty big step backward from, from any number that you look at time form buyer, whatever you want to look at. This is a, a regression from imagination and stronghold took advantage of it. Um, outside of those two, there was absolutely nothing in here. So you got to think that, you know, those were the two that that ran well. I mean, Winstock, I guess you could say was something with Baffert there. But uh, like Winstock clearly had no interest. And Winstock supposedly working really well into this race, too, which was uh, which was kind of surprising that he he threw up a dud here. Look, I thought Stronghold did a great job, was able to stalk a fast pace again and get by a horse who I believe was better than him. So uh, hat tip to Stronghold. Absolutely no interest in any in Stronghold in the Derby, though. 
Um, I I liked going in this race. I liked him to fill out the exotics in the Derby. I still do. It's not as strong of a like because this also is going to hurt his price. I thought he might run second to Imagination or May Moon, you know, some Baffert, and then get in off of that. But I love what he does right here. If you're watching live, he's going to have to split horses because EJ won the cup, Turf Paradise Derby winner, uh, and Imagination. He's got to split between them. Um, and he still fought on. Uh, yeah. I know that the Phil D'Amato team was overjoyed. I saw a picture of Jessica Pfeiffer, uh, his, his stepdaughter, TV on Santa Anita. She was in tears over it. So uh, that was pretty great. Uh, yeah, he, he fought. There's one thing. I'm going to keep this video going. I love what happens later after if they show the gallop out because you had two amazing Italian jockeys in Fries, Antonio Friesu, the winner, Frankie Dettori, who won five of the first six races at San Diego that day. He won six uh, in a row. Was, that's right. He did win he six, won in, six a row. in a row. Watch. Oh, did I cut off right before it happened? Um, they high-fived, and there's a picture I'm going to pull up in a second to show. Dettori was so happy for Friesu to win. Like, he came over afterwards and was, like, congratulating him. Like, the horse is going in the winner's circle, and they had to stop because Dettori wanted to come over and uh, and, and congratulate him. So, Dettori, you know, even with the defeat, could appreciate that that was a hell of a horse race. Um, one other horse I want to talk about, the number seven, McVeigh, gelled this horse. Gelled this horse immediately. He is such a screwball. He gets super screwy into the corner. Yep. He's like, at one point, he takes a weird step and almost throws Barrios right out of the irons. It's going to happen uh, any second here on the screen. Um, right There it is, right there. He almost goes off the side of the horse, and Barrios has to get himself back into the irons. Like, that horse has got talent. Gelled the living you-know-what out of him because he <laughs> that's he's never going to do anything if you don't. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. It feels like uh, maybe a good idea here to geld, geld McVeigh in this spot. Not great for the Rams, uh, but a good idea here for the horse uh, to, to, to do it. I'm not – I mean, we'll see what happens with McVeigh moving forward. The, the, the California crop, when you take out the Bafferts that are the really good ones, and Imagination's not one of the really good ones, it's just – it's a cut below. And, and that's kind of what you saw here with the San Diego Derby. Uh, Imagination Land call from Frank Miramani would be pretty great. I agree, Chris Milo. Uh, there was one – where did Rodney bring it up? He asked a great question. So let's assume – Ambrose Zidane's new lawsuit against Churchill Downs allows Muth to run. Where would he be first, second? I think he'd be third choice in the in the Kentucky Derby, just because he's not going to be with Baffert, right? Zidane's lawsuit, if he wins it, is not going to let the horse run for Baffert. It's just to let the horse run for someone else. So yeah. I don't think the betting public would ride that necessarily. You think he'd be third choice for the Derby? Probably third choice, maybe fourth. Um, if he was with Baffert, I think he would be second choice or the favorite. Um Without Baffert, I think he's probably third or fourth choice. Yeah, I agree on that one. Uh, let's see. I'll pull up the, uh, the Equibase chart here real quick. Uh, not a whole lot else to say. I think with Winstock, the reason he didn't run that well, um, he didn't get the lead. And that horse has shown, if you look at his past performances, when he gets the lead, he's great because he can just run all day on the front end there. But we saw in the – was it the Rebel Station or the Southwest at Oakland? I forget which one he was in, but – he uh, he didn't get the lead in that. He, he just never looked that great. Doc says, I don't know for sure, that Winstock supposedly flipped in the paddock and hit his head prior to the race. I'm surprised if that happened. They didn't even scratch him, but that could also lead to. So if you liked Winstock, scratch this one off. Uh, play him back in an easier spot where you can think he'll get the lead. Yeah, I, Winstock is a horse that, that needs the lead. And like I said, it was supposedly working extremely well heading into this race, too. So uh, I'm kind of surprised this was the effort we got. And they were they were trying to teach him how to rate going into the race. And obviously, that didn't work out so great because he was not able to. Because uh, it was the Southwest that he was in, not able to make the lead. And just kind of didn't, never turned around for him. I, like, I don't know. This is another one. Like McVeigh, like Winstock, like EJ won the cup. I don't know how good they really are. Because I don't, yeah. you don't get to see them run against the best horses in California. And so it's like, you're kind of it's everything with a grain of salt to me with these horses, because I know they're not the best of California. And like if Muth was in this race, he's instead of the, the Arkansas Derby, he's one to or two to five, probably. Oh yeah. Yeah. And wins by eight lengths. Like, yes, it just, it just makes it really hard to get excited about these horses. Yeah. Imagination is a fun horse, but uh, I said it going into this and I think he proved it again. He runs to his competition. He runs as well as he thinks he needs to, and he doesn't run any harder than that. And he stayed right there with Stronghold, but 
uh, if he had that normal Baffert rebreak at the top of the stretch, like he should have taken off. He's just that kind of horse. And he did rebreak a little bit. I I was like positive he was going to win the race mid stretch when he actually came back up to stronghold. I'm like, oh, he's going to go. We got the Baffert rebreak going on here, and uh, <laughs> just couldn't quite finish the job, even though he did take the lead again for a second. What race was that? Oh, Country Grammar winning uh, the Gold Cup. I, f- I think it was Country Grammar winning the Gold Cup at Santa Anita. I was on the rail watching and with Geist, and uh, he rebroke on Royal Ship, and we just started screaming at the top of our lungs, rebreak as yeah. he drove past because you just visually like thirty feet in front of us. We just went, oh, there it goes. <laughs> There's the Baffert rebreak. <laughs> you know, it's, it's um, when it's when it happens. You know, you're like, oh. Nope, there it is. There it is. Yes. I gotta say, like I agree with Curtis too. Teaching horses to rate, just like let horse fast horses be fast. Just, just let them roll, man. Like it. Why? Why? It's like if you said, okay, we got a really good three point shooter. He's not gonna shoot any threes today. We're just gonna drive to the lane. We're just gonna pass up on the like. If it's your best attribute, use your best attribute. It's a good, yes. good thing to use. Yeah, you got one weapon. It's speed. Yeah. Don't take it away from Elizabeth. Well, at least they experimented here, not in the Kentucky Derby, when there's a lot more money riding on the line for uh, a lot of people to be very pissed off. Speed of the Kentucky Derby, these are the circa odds provided courtesy of Mike Samich. He sent this to me before the show. So this is going to be great. Fierceness, your favorite right now at three to one. Sierra Leone just behind them at three and a quarter. Catching Freedom, eight to one. Forever Young, 10 to one. Doorknock, 12 to one. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 horses that are 35 to 1 or lower. Uh, you can get our boy Encino at 350 to 1. All he needs to do is win the Lexington and get a couple of uh, scratches out of that, and then you'll be able to get him in the Kentucky Derby at 350 to 1. Uh, what do you think about these odds, and who is your choice off of what you see? I think they are correct for the most part. Um, I think Fierceness is your favorite. I think Fierceness will go off as your favorite, assuming nothing changes. Obviously, we've got uh, about a month till the race. So I, if there is something that happens, that could that could move it. But I think that Fierceness is early on. Clearly, your first and second choices. I'm surprised Forever Young is 10 to 1. Uh, I would think Forever Young would be a shorter price than Catching Freedom. I'm surprised Doorknock is 12 to 1 because... I would have a lot of horses in front of Doorknock. Um, so, like uh, after the first two, it gets a little funky. I don't think Fierceness and Sierra Leone should be the same price. I think there should be more of a gap um, in in those two. Uh, if you look at at Fierceness and you look at the Florida Derby, like I realize, like consistency, a huge problem for Fierceness. We all all can agree on that. Yep. But the Florida Derby came back. I think it was twelve buyer points higher than what we saw from Sierra Leone in the Bluegrass. I think it was a seventeen or fifteen point or time form points higher than mm-hmm. what we saw. So, like a clear differentiator between those two races, and yet we're seeing the same price. And I would make the argument: Fierceness's trip is going to be significantly easier than Sierra Leone's trip. Um, so I, I'm surprised they're the same price at the top. I would have Fierceness at three to one. I would have Sierra Leone closer to five to one if I was trying to make odds, like true odds here. Five six to one, and then I would have Forever Young as the next price, and and Forever Young closing at eighteen to one, I think is a great price over the weekend. If you're able to to get a piece of that, it feels like he's being forgotten a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I think that for the most part, like I, I kind of agree that the top four, the correct top four, I think those are going to be your four favorites. Um, it, it's just I I would change the pricing a little bit. Fierk Paul going with our boy sixteen to one, Honor Marie, uh, same price as Mystic Dan. That feels about right. I'm with you on Doorknock. Is like what. Like, Wait, what do you think? <laughs> I didn't know it was you. The semi this is like, is this from last week? Like, where did these odds come from with him at 12 to one? Yeah, I don't I don't see it on there. Uh, Rodney likes endlessly at 20 to one dark horse for him in this one. Um, just deal at 25 to one. I don't think he wins, but that's not bad. Resilience 35 to one off the wood memorial. Is there anybody on this right side? The, the you know the sixteen through whatever here. Is there anybody there that interests you at those very very most all of them are five digit odds. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm I'm gonna sound like a broken record in a way here. Why not the second place horse from the Florida Derby? <laughs> Catalytic sitting there at a hundred to one. Um, I disagree. Like I, I don't <laughs> think Catalytic should be a hundred to one. I think he should be more like thirty five to one, thirty to one. Like I, I think that's exponentially incorrect for what the odds should actually be for that horse uh it's a lightly raced horse he's got a chance to improve off that race fierceness's race is clearly the best prep that we saw of any of the preps like not even close and catalytic 
was close to the pace, three wide into the first turn, three wide into the second turn. It never gone to like, there's a lot to like about that horse taking a step forward. And uh, yeah, hundred to one seems wild. 200 to one is crazy too. In the future pool there, I, I think catalytic has a shot at, at, at blowing up the super. I mean, that's going to be one of those horses where depending on the draw, because we say this like all of this a month out, the draw show so much changes in that like real time in that hour that we do the Monday before the Derby because you get all of this new information and, and depending on where these horses draw, who's actually in the field, where the speed draws and then where the closers draw, you can change your opinion on this stuff pretty quickly. But uh, catalytic at 100 to one, I think, is a big price. Honestly, Encino at 350 to one uh, it seems like a little wild of a price as well. But the problem is he's got to make the Derby. You're essentially parlaying three different out three different things that need to happen, which is he wins the Lexington. He get I think it's three defections. And then he needs to, and then needs to win the the Derby, and that's a that's a, a little bit too much of a parlay. That's one hell of a yeah of a three team parlay right there. Um, <coughs> excuse me. At the bottom there, I'll scroll up a little bit so people can see. There's two fun little yes no bets. Fierceness to win the Derby is yes is plus three hundred. No is minus three eighty. Sierra Leone to win the Derby, of course, plus three twenty five. No is minus four fifteen. So uh, a lot more people think it's more likely that Sierra Leone doesn't win then fierceness doesn't win uh at those odds the no bets because i know that's where you're gonna you're sitting with both of these do you play both of those do you like those odds is there one you like better than the other um honestly i would never play the fierceness no because i think a better way to play the fierceness no is to leave them out of your tries or supers uh, like there's a world where fierceness just runs a dud and doesn't hit the board and all of a sudden that blows all the prices up so i would rather spend my money without fierceness in a try or a super and play it that way sierra leone i think minus 415 is a pretty fair price on the note to be honest like i i does does he win this race one of every four times not so sure. Like, you know, like that, that seems to me like it's a little bit short, but then I also think he should be plus 500. So I'm naturally going to gravitate to the minus 415 there for the no. Um, I will tell you this though. Like I do think Sierra Leone and head to heads is going to be a very profitable horse. Like give me a head to head Sierra Leone and door knock. Give me a head to head in some other spots. Like I, I think that that Sierra Leone's going to run the race. I just don't know if everything needs to go right for Sierra Leone to win. It's again, it's like the Tapa Trice thing. I'm not, and I, I realize I, I, I'm higher on Sierra Leone right now than I was Tapa Trice this time last year. But like, I, I think Sierra Leone's got a boatload of talent. I just don't like the trip. And when you watch back that 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 uh, race at Keelan over the weekend, the bluegrass, Sierra Leone's a really big horse, like very big horse that's going to need to weave through traffic. And so, um, yeah, I'm not, not sure about that. And, and the thing with Anna Marie, the thing with, Catching Freedom, they're similar to Sierra Leone. Now, Catching Freedom's a little more athletic, but ran his best when he was on the outside. That's kind of scary. Um, and Anna Marie, like, is still kind of goofy. Like that, the, we if you go back and you watch that Risen Star, Anna Marie didn't run half that race, and then kind of yeah. figured it out in the stretch. So, <laughs> to me, there's still a lot of things here where you're kind of working through some of these permutations. And then again, the draw is going to be so important for this. And, and where is the speed going to come from? Where is a horse like, like, okay, let's say you're Sierra Leone what happens if you draw the one, two, three, or four? Like that's a death sentence in a lot of ways because the mm -hmm. chance that you were even in 15th is out the door if you draw inside. So it, it's just, there's, there are just a lot of horses where I, I need to see where they're placed before I can kind of make official picks here. But like, for me, I like fierceness. I like forever young. I like catching freedom. I respect Sierra Leone. I respect Donna Marie. I respect cataclytic, uh, catalytic. Um, I think just a touch is interesting. I think uh, resilience at this point is interesting. Uh, I think Encino, if he makes it, is interesting. Outside of that, I think it's it's going to be uh, it, it's going to be tough to beat those horses. I didn't want to do it, Mike, but there's been some requests, multiple requests in the chat. So let's talk about the Kentucky Oaks real quick. The reason I didn't want to do it is because I thought the couple of races that we saw on Saturday were pretty mad, but I forgot about Friday, the Ashland Stakes. Where the hell did Leslie's Rose find that <laughs> effort to win that? I mean, she destroyed that field destroyed them uh here's your oaks top six on the screen what do you think about that and who do you like moving forward uh i thought leslie's rose looked great i, I think he, like this was a horse that was drafted in the first round of the triple crown draft so you know that there's some talent there um <laughs> uh, i still can't believe she got drafted uh like i think leslie's rose could could Easily, like again, if, if we show up with the A race, could could compete with Tarafa. I Tarafa is by far the most impressive for me. I, I where, where's the ring? 
where's my ring? Whatever. No, thanks. Not really that that interested. Um, yeah, like Taraf, I think, has been the best horse throughout this sequence. We'll see what the price is on her when it comes to, to the first Friday in May there. Leslie's Rose, I think, is interesting. But now I'm worried we're not like she was nine to one on Friday. What's she going to be in the Oaks? Like, was that the wedding? And then are we going to attend yes. the funeral? Because it sure feels that way. Uh, just FYI, I thought looked okay coming back. Like, that's another one where we've seen her be able to run big races on big days. Um, I, it doesn't feel like this is the most talented group, though. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, I think the biggest disappointment, well, two disappointments. Impel, uh, I thought would run better than she did, and she just she looked overmatched. Uh, Jody's pride was pretty disappointing in that race as well. Um, didn't really take a step forward as hasn't taken a step forward as a three-year-old. And she, along with Candy, who's if that horse ever figures out how to change her damn lead, she might actually be a grade one winner again. But um, those two horses were barreling down on just what FYI right at the very end of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Just FYI has looked a lot better. And I really like that. I think that she's got the most upside from the horses we saw, which is weird because I wasn't a big fan of her going mm -hmm. into this race. She missed her start. She was supposed to start, was it uh, Tampa Bay? I forget where she's, she was supposed to show up somewhere, and then she scratched up. I might have been Gulfstream. I think it was Devona Dale, And they, yeah. they, they scratched her. Uh, something had happened to mess up her training. And she has one start and into the Kentucky Oaks. So second start for Bill Mott. You would assume she takes a step forward. With everything that went wrong for her not running in five months, I was actually more impressed with just FYI than I thought I would be. So she's probably one that I'm looking to play out of this list as well. Um, beyond that though, this is, uh, I mean, this is, you know, what makes me mad. I can go all the way down. My girl intricates 18th, like she needs four scratches to get into this race. And I would love to play her in the Kentucky Oaks because she needs a 14 horse field to get a big win. It seems like, so I mean, she might get four scratches. That's true. I mean, this isn't exactly a, a group of world beaters here. We'll see how aggressive people want to get. I mean, obviously, Lucas is going to run, but we'll see how aggressive, like, you know, the, the like tap it, uh, Jenna Lily or Jenna, Jenna Alley. We'll see what happens there. Um, I will see if regulatory risk goes like I there's there's some here that I think are made defect out of the race. So we'll see what happens here. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's your Kentucky Oaks talk for the uh, the most people who asked for it. That's what we think about it. Thanks so much for joining Mike and I to cover all the Derby and I guess Oaks prep races from the past weekend here. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. This was the last weekend of the major prep. So uh, we've got the Lexington Stakes to look forward to. We'll have full preview for that over at racingdudes.com as well as I found out today we're doing a Lexington Stakes betting Bible. Everything went so well profit-wise at Keeneland last weekend. Dude said, let's run it back. So make sure you head over to racingdudes.com and check out the betting Bible. As a reminder, if you're a subscriber to any of our monthly products, which could be the picks from Aaron that are every every race, every track, every day. If it's the Samo Bombs, which you should get that because it's Keeneland time and that's where he does really well. Any of those gets you all of the Bibles included for the duration of your subscription. So right now, if you decide to sign up for the Samo Bombs today on Monday, April 8th, you're going to get the Lexington Bible included. You're also going to get the Kentucky Derby betting Bible included as well. And that thing is super loaded. It's, it's like 15 pages long and it's going to have bets for every single race from Aaron and Jared for both of those tracks and those races. So please go check those out at racenews.com if you haven't yet. Mike, before we leave, any final thoughts on the championship game tonight for college basketball? Uh, I, I talked about this on the handle on Saturday. You could bet look ahead lines. I played UConn minus five and a half uh, against Purdue before either game tipped on Saturday. Um, I, I think I have UConn minus seven in my numbers as the favorite. Uh, they are now up to six and a half, seven, seven and a half, even in some places. Uh, I think it, the number is right now. I would still lean toward UConn if I was going to uh, have a little pizza bet in here. I do like the under. Under 146, I think, is a solid play in that spot. And then a uh, little Masters talk. I did put 18 to 1 Brooks Kepka in the account. So uh, hopefully we can get him home. And then I like Victor Hovland top five plus 650 as well. So a little, little early Masters action too. Uh, I like this. Rob has been saying this a lot uh, lately. UConn first half spread has been a consistent winner. So go with that. I like the Huskies to win it all. I, I, I just have never liked Purdue in anything ever. So yeah. I just... I don't like Purdue. It's just a dumb, it's a dumb, like a boiler maker. Like that's such a dumb mascot. <laughs>
it's going to be interesting to see how what they do against Edie as well. I mean, Edie has been a force this tournament for Purdue. We saw NC State be able to single team them. It really limited the open threes that you got from Purdue. I think UConn does something similar tonight. And while UConn is wildly efficient on the offensive end, they're 303rd in possessions per game in the NCAA. And Purdue loves to run set plays. I just don't think we're going to have that, that explosive of a game tonight. Well, make sure you check out Mike Samich over on the VSIN network covering sports all year long. And make sure you head over to racingnews.com. Free picks for every race, every track, every day across the country. We will be back for the Magic Mike Show 541 this Thursday at 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific. And we will uh, be covering Keeneland's late pick five because we love Keeneland. We, the show ticket, if you combined it like Shadi did, you were able to cash out and cash it very well. So uh, go check that out over there. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Chris Kellerward. He's at Summer Bomb 18, number one, number eight, corporate overlords at racing underscore dudes. Until Thursday, I'm Magic. And I'm Mike. Good luck this week. The Magic Mike Show. Where you hear the experts speak. The Magic Mike Show. Tune into the show every week. The Magic Mike Show. You can trust the show is the bomb because it's being brought to you by racingdudes.com.